So over the last decade or so, one of the things that's become really popular in literature and in movies is the young adult uh, dystopian future novel or movie. The, the flagship of these is the uh, the Hunger Games, right? Uh, with Katniss, uh, Jennifer Lawrence, and the, the world has had some disaster and the nation is divided into districts. And for some reason, they send two kids from each district to compete in this violent game uh, of which there is a revolution, the government is overthrown and everybody is happy, I think. I didn't see the end of it. Uh, another one is called Divergent, which only got two movies. Uh, they didn't get to a third one. Uh, but again, you're divided into like factions, again, uh, like Harry Potter Hogwarts houses. And uh, if you don't have a, a, a house or a group, you're factionless, it's all this bad stuff. And then there's one called The Maze Runner, which only got one movie, it didn't even get additional uh, movies. Uh, but the big plot twist there is it's a bunch of guys and the plot twist is a girl shows up, uh, which is very true to like my middle school experience, which was, oh my goodness, there's a girl. Um, but all that being said, in none of these dystopian futures did anybody picture that the apocalypse would actually look like us just sitting in our homes trying to figure out whether or not to wear a mask. Like, talk about the most boring book ever. We're all just sitting in our homes, sitting in our houses, hanging out, and trying to figure out when this pandemic would end. Imagine somebody writing that book and probably how little sales that person would have. The point I'm trying to make, uh, all joking aside, is that the future that we're in, this new normal that we're in, is not something any of us really prepared for. Nobody was ready for this. Nobody thought that this was uh, what was going to happen. Maybe you had your zombie apocalypse plan, but nobody had their stay-at-home pandemic plan sitting in their back pocket unless you've like dug, dug a shelter in your backyard or something like that. So what I want us to do today, as we're looking at the end of Daniel, we're going to look at several chapters of the book of Daniel today. And I want us to see how we can really uh, respond to this new normal. We can kind of find some, some real pillars to kind of anchor to and come back to, to reset. Because frankly, this is going on a lot longer than maybe many of us thought. So I want to give us four things, looking at the four visions of Daniel, starting in chapter uh, seven of the book of Daniel. Four things that we can kind of cling to, to respond uh, to the uh, the pandemic, sort of the, the new normal that we're in. So the first one that we need is control. We need control. Now, what I'm going to do is for each of these visions, I'm not going to read them. They're very, very long, but I want to take like a section out of them and just talk about it. But uh, so I'll describe the vision to you the best that I can. In the first vision that Daniel has in chapter seven is he looks and he sees monsters, beasts, coming out of the sea. And for most of us, I think we think biblical visions are all very serene. Like somebody's just praying gently. There's an angel kind of gently with a hand on a shoulder and everybody's really pious and holy. That is not the image that Daniel gives us. Daniel's image is like a waking nightmare. This is terrifying. These aren't just animals coming up out of the ocean. They are full on monsters. And Daniel even says, he says that this vision alarms him. He's anxious and his color changes. The man is freaked out by what he's seeing. And so he sees these four monsters coming up out of the sea. And the fourth one is really terrifying. He has 10 horns and iron teeth, and he's just this scary thing. And one of the horns, this little horn, kind of pops up and uproots the other four. And this horn starts talking all this smack, blasphemous stuff, evil stuff, angry stuff. He's just talking, 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 talking. And the, the angel explains that these four beasts are four kings, four kingdoms. And this little horn is a king that is not going to be content with just ruling the world. He's going to want to supplant God as ruler of all creation. He's going to be an earthly king that thinks he's better than even the creator of the universe. And remember, we saw this with Nebuchadnezzar, how Nebuchadnezzar elevated himself over God and he was uh, humiliated. He was made to be like a beast. And so it makes sense why this image that Daniel's getting is one of a beast. This person is a beast. He's, he's, he's lost his humanity because he's trying to be something he's not. And in the middle of this vision, Daniel actually sees a, 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 refreshing, a, a, a refreshing image. And it's in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him, and a thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books 
were opened. Now, what I think is really interesting about this picture, it's kind of surreal, in that the Ancient of Days obviously is, is God, it's Yahweh. And, and the Ancient of Days is pictured the way that we kind of pop culture picture God, kind of old, white flowing hair, beard, ancient. Like there's this vivid imagery of God. And, and the white hair, the white clothing implies purity. It implies wisdom. The fire shows judgment going forth from God. And then the wheels that are described are the, the fact that God's justice is far reaching. It's not going to stop. And so the reason why all these people are gathered around, it tells us in verse 11, why all these thousands are gathered. They're there to see the judgment of the beast. Verse 11, I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. This beast is just talking, talking, talking. And as judgment comes out, he's still talking and talking and talking. He's still running his mouth the whole time. In fact, that should be a good uh, side note. Beware of little horns with big mouths. Beware of little horns with big mouths in whatever sphere we find them in. Because they tend to talk and talk and talk right up until the last possible second uh, when they meet their end. So that what happens is when God issues forth this judgment, it creates a power vacuum. And if you, you're familiar with Aristotle's statement, nature abhors a vacuum. And so there's this power vacuum that's created. These kings have fallen apart. The world's kind of in shambles. And into this power vacuum, somebody needs to step in and control the chaos that's taking place. And here is the person in verse 13. I saw in the night visions. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So this ruler, this ruler is the son of man, comes on the clouds. Now he's, he looks like a human being, looks like Daniel. That's why he calls him a son of man. But he comes on the clouds, which implies divinity. It implies righteousness. It implies power and majesty beyond what a human being would have. So he's both divine and human. And he's not like the other beast that stepped into the power vacuum. He's not like a beast at all. He's like a man. In fact, when he, when he approaches the throne, he doesn't take the power for himself like the beast did before. He's given that power and authority by the Ancient of Days. His kingdom is not temporary like the beast's kingdom were. His kingdom is everlasting and eternal. The people who serve him almost do so willingly and they're flourishing in the midst of their service. They're not oppressed and controlled by these monsters. And reading on this side of the New Testament, we know who this Son of Man is. It's Jesus Christ. It's the Messiah, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who was crucified, buried, and resurrected, who the Son of God who put on flesh and dwelt among us, a man and God in the same person. And we know that when he was resurrected, he ascended to heaven, and he's going to come back one day, and he's going to establish his kingdom. Daniel is seeing that image vividly. I don't know if Daniel understood what he was seeing, but that's what he's See. So make no mistake, and, and maybe you're sensing this in your world right now, in your personal life, in the world at large, is that, that there's a power vacuum being created. The old things that we used to cling to, the old structures that we held onto for security and control, those things are eroded and, and are eroding even as we speak. And so what do we do? Well, uh, maybe you see it in yourself. Maybe you see places where the things that you felt like you had control, uh, they've shifted. Uh, maybe you found uh, out that you're non-essential in your job, and so you found security in being able to work really hard, and now guess what? You're, you're not working anymore. Maybe you found out you're not as good of a spouse or a, a parent as you thought you were because you were actually using your work as a way to escape. And now that you're home all the time, you're finding out that maybe I'm not the best at being home all the time with my kids. Maybe your status as a party host or a networker or a traveler or an athlete or a restaurateur or a fashionista, those things are not uh, places where you can display your, your gifts and your talents anymore because those things aren't going on right now. You don't have an avenue to show those giftings. So into this power vacuum, you can look to the old things that you used to put your trust in. You can look to your education and think, man, I, I, I'm smart enough. I can figure this out. You can look to your materialism and say, I've got a nest egg saved up. I'm going to ride out the storm. You can look to the election. Man, if I can just get our guy in office or keep our guy in office in November, everything's going to be just fine. And we've seen that those things don't really work for us. 
or you can give it over to the Son of Man, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You can turn control over your life to him. His kingdom's not temporary, it's eternal, it's stable. It's not based on infection numbers or based on market shares. It's based on the unshakable faithfulness of God. You can give that to him today. Maybe you've never done that before. All it is, is taking your brokenness, your sinfulness, your inability to have all the answers, which let's face it, that's everyone, and saying, Lord Jesus, please take my fears, take my uncertainty, take my failures, and give me your lordship. Rescue me, save me. And I believe you'll do that because you've proven you'll do that on the cross. You showed that to me on the cross where you died for me. And you came back to life. And I believe I can, I can be, live with you forever in an eternal kingdom that's stable based on what you've done for me. Maybe you've been a believer for a long time, but maybe you don't really know how to give God control of your life. Maybe you, you, you've just kind of ignored that part of being a follower of Jesus. Let me tell you how to do that. It's real easy. Well, it's real simple. Follow your fears. What are you worried about? What are you anxious about? What are you scared of? What wakes you up at night and keeps you up at night? In short, follow your monsters. Follow the monsters, the things that you're terrified of, and let them be conquered by Jesus Christ. Don't try to conquer them yourself. Don't try to rule over him yourself. Don't try to be the tough guy or the tough girl. Give it over to Jesus Christ. Ask him to take control of these monsters. Confess your inability to control them. Ask him to see what power structures you're supposed to trust and which ones you're supposed to ignore, resist. Remember these beasts that came up in Daniel's vision, they come out of the sea and the sea represents chaos in scripture. God wants to control the chaos of our lives if we will just let him. So when we give Jesus Christ control, it leads us down two divergent paths. See what I did there, divergent? You come down two divergent paths that we actually get to take both of them. The, the, the road kind of splits and we have two uh, choices, not necessarily two choices, two ways to travel down the path. And we're actually gonna take both of them today. We're gonna be able to contribute and we're gonna be able to confess. So let's talk about contribution. Let's talk about contribution by looking at the next vision. So two years later, Daniel has yet another vision. And this one's a little bit more familiar to us. He has a vision of, of a goat, or sorry, a ram with two horns. One horn is larger than the other one. And this, horn, this ram is unstoppable. It's doing whatever it wants until a goat out of the West, which I never thought I'd be saying that uh, to people, but a goat out of the West comes and, and attacks the ram with a big, and he has a big horn in the center of his head and he, he beats the ram. And then that horn breaks and four horns pop up on the goat and one little horn, again, a little horn pops up and starts doing all the talking and the, and the blaspheming that it was doing and begins to attack God's people. Now, an angel actually steps in in chapter eight and explains very clearly what this vision is. He says the ram with two horns is the Medo-Persian empire and it's gonna rule and reign for a little while, but then Greece is the goat and it's gonna come out of the West and it's gonna have a great leader. We know this to be Alexander the Great and it's gonna tackle and destroy the Medo-Persian empire, which we know happens. But Alexander's kingdom isn't gonna last that long. The horn breaks, Alexander dies and four kingdoms rise up out of his kingdom. His generals divide the kingdom into four parts and they take a part each. Out of this, after a couple of centuries, a ruler named Antiochus IV, the little horn rises up and he wants to be big and bad, but he can't because the Roman empire kind of holds him in check. So what he does is he takes his aggression out on God's people. He attacks them. He persecutes them. He even sets up an altar to Zeus within the temple. He's just an all around bad guy. And an angel, after explaining this dream, uh, this brings a, up a, a feeling of, of disaster for Daniel. Look at how he responds to this vision in chapter 8, verse 27. It says, And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but was appalled by the vision, and I did not understand it. Daniel's response to this new normal that he sees is he's sick. He's upset. He lays down in bed for a while. He says he doesn't understand the vision. And I don't think this means like he doesn't get it cognitively. Daniel's a smart guy and an angel explains it to him. I think Daniel doesn't understand why this is happening. Like, why is this going on, Lord? What, is, what does this mean? Because he's received some good news. The kingdom of God is coming. He, that first vision, uh, the son of man is going to come and is, is going to rule over everything and it's going to be great. But this vision is bad news. 
Because the exile of the Jews was supposed to end after 70 years, and it does. When Cyrus takes over the Babylonian Empire, he sends the Jews back to Judah, and, and they rebuild the temple, and that's supposed to be great. Except according to this vision, the, Judah's not going to get its prestige back. It's not going to get its independence back. It's not going to get everything back the way it was. It's not going to go back to the old normal. The new normal of Daniel's life is actually going to continue well past the time when Daniel dies. He may live to see the end of the exile, but he's not going to live to see the kingdom restored. And he's devastated. But it also says he goes about the king's business. And I think this is a way forward for us too. Because face it, we are in an era, a time period where this, this pandemic is going on a lot longer than we thought it would. We're like Daniel. We're receiving sort of indications that this, this strange world we're in is, is going to continue on for a while. And we're discouraged by it. So we need to go about, we need to be about the king's business. Because think about how absolutely frustrating this must have been for Daniel. If I'm Daniel, I'm sick of the future. I'm looking at the empire that I've spent my entire life working for, the Babylonian empire, and it's going to crumble. He, he, he has these visions that he knows it's going to fall apart. He's got to think, man, why, why did I put all this effort in this influence and this job that I've had for so long when it's just going to fall apart? In fact, if I'm Daniel, I'm probably thinking, like, I wonder if the Medo-Persians are accepting applications. I, I, I can see dreams. That's probably useful. Or I'm going to contact the Greeks because it looks like they win in the end. Or does anybody know uh, the LinkedIn account of the Little Horn? I'll contact him and get a job with him. Maybe I can stave off some of the persecution of people. I'm jumping ship. This, is, this, this thing's going down. How many of you today feel frustrated? You feel stuck. I talked to somebody this week that said they didn't feel stuck until people reminded them that they were stuck. So I'm sorry about that. But that's called frustration. We're frustrated. We're spinning our wheels. We don't like the new normal. We don't want to be faithful where we are because we want to be faithful somewhere else. Life is on this lather, rinse, repeat cycle and we can't get out of it. We're just kind of spinning our wheels. Churches are closing uh, back again. Our churches had to push back our start date, which was discouraging for us as a staff because we want to be together. We want to celebrate and worship together, but we also want to stay faithful to what we've been given to do, which is shepherd you and make sure you're safe. Schools opening have been pushed back, which is bad news for parents, right? We thought getting back to the new normal, getting back to the old normal would happen a lot sooner than it has. But we have to be about the king's business. We have to be about thinking through what does God want us to do in the time that we have right now. Now is not the time to be selfish. Now is not the time to be focused on how all this is affecting you. Now is not the time to give up hope and despair. If you want to know whether or not you're spending this time rightly, if you're, if you're being faithful to what God's calling you to do, ask yourself one diagnostic question. How much of my time am I thinking about how this is affecting me? Versus how much time am I spending thinking about how it's affecting others? Think about your boss. Are you thinking about how they're making bad decisions and how they're leading your company wrongly or how they're making mistakes or are they going to lay me off? Or are you thinking about how maybe this is hard for your boss and how difficult it is for them? Are you praying for your, your boss, your supervisors, praying for the people that lead your company? Are you thinking about your neighbors and whether or not they need anything and how you're engaging with them in the middle of this time? Are you thinking about senior adults? who are trapped maybe more than any of us. Think about how to care for them and reach out to them. Let me ask you this. Are you willing to wear a mask? Not because uh, you think you need to. I'm not going to get into that conversation. But are you willing to wear a mask just to make other people feel comfortable? To feel safe and secure? That is a selfless act. Real self-centeredness is the opposite. Real self-centeredness is always, how does this affect me? You interpret everything that ever happens through a lens of how does this affect me first? And then I'm going to worry about other people. We act like we're on this plane and we've got to make sure our mask is secure first and then we can help other people. That's not always the case. Real Christ-likeness, if you want to grow, know if you're growing in the image of Christ, is thinking through how is this affecting other people first. Think about Jesus. In the Gospels, Jesus weeps, he cries. He never weeps for himself. Jesus cannot be described as somebody who has self-pity. Jesus' greatest grief outside the cross is grief for other people. The heart of Jesus, his business, is moving towards the suffering and the sinful, not away from them, not withdrawing from them, not for long periods of time anyway. And if you're wondering, yes, I was woefully convicted as I wrote this. I'm woefully convicted as I'm saying this because this is an area where I need to grow too and I need you to help me grow in this way also. 
Start making contributions, finding places to serve by asking, how is this affecting this person or this group of people? And what can I do to help? It is that simple. Again, it's not easy, but it's that simple. If you have given God control over your life, you can trust him to take care of your needs and your desires, and you can start thinking about the needs and desires of other people. But God's control over our lives doesn't just lead us down a pathway of contribution. It also leads us down a pathway of confession. Confession. Another, another vision that we can have for this new normal is one of confession. So this, this next chapter, chapter uh, 9, is, is not actually a vision. So I took a liberty there. It's actually a revelation. And we're no longer in the Babylonian Empire. It's actually a Persian one. So the, the visions that Daniel's had are starting to come true. And he's living in a Persian empire. He still has a place of significance and influence in the Persian empire. But he is doing something that some of you, many of you, hopefully, are very familiar with. He's reading scripture. He's spending time in the word and he's reading the prophecy of Jeremiah. And what he sees in Jeremiah is that the end of the 70 years, the 70 years of exile, is actually coming to a close. And so he's like, oh man, this is, this is supposed to be over soon. We're supposed to go back soon. And so he begins to pray. He begins to pray. And let's see what he says, this time of worship that he has in chapter 9, starting in verse 3. And what, what I want you to see here is the back and forth between Daniel and God. God. Daniel begins to describe how God is, and then he talks about how he and his people are. And this goes back and forth, and I'll try to indicate where those changes take place as I'm reading. Then I turned my face, this is Daniel, to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Now he shifts to the people. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, Princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. Now he shifts back to God. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness. Back to the people. But to us, open shame as at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far all in all the lands to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame to our kings, to our princes and to our fathers because we've sinned against you. Back to God. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. Back to the people, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. I know that's a lengthy reading. It goes on. It keeps going on, this, this interchange between Daniel and God, this discussion. And, and what Daniel is doing is he's confessing. And what I think is cool is when, after all this study in Daniel that we've done is I don't think any of us would describe Daniel the way he just described himself, including with his people. He listens to the words of the prophets. He's a righteous man. He tries to serve the Lord. So why does he lump himself in with the people? It's because Daniel has an understanding of, of sort of corporate sin. He understands that, that brokenness isn't just relegated to a person. Brokenness infects a people group and it affects their structures. Brokenness is a, is a thing that's like a disease, like a pandemic. It's infective. It, it gets everywhere. And Daniel's humble and he includes himself in the brokenness. Genuine confessional worship has to be like Daniel's. Confessional worship isn't just telling God how bad of a person I am. Confessional worship is confessing who I believe God to be. It's two parts. God, this is who you are. This is who you've revealed yourself to be. You're righteous. You're good. You're holy. You're just. You're magnificent. You're the creator. You should have control of my life. All these things about how God has revealed himself in scripture and through nature and through the person of Jesus Christ. And what that should do is it should show you, oh man, God's all these things and I'm not any of those things. Now, sometimes that might lead you to despair. You might think to yourself, oh wow, I'm such a, a heap of trash compared to what God is. God could never love me. Well, then you're not fully understanding who God's revealed himself to be because God also is loving. He's merciful. He's kind. He's shown that to us on the cross. He desires a relationship with us. He desires to know us and to dwell among us. We have to admit, we have to confess who God is, and we have to confess that we don't always live our life in light of who God has revealed himself to be. Confessional worship is not just knowing a bunch of, of theology, knowing a bunch of doctrine, knowing a bunch of lyrics to songs, and putting them to pretty music. 
Confessional worship comes from the heart. It comes from the heart. And it's the interaction, the interchange of these two things, of knowing who God is and saying who we are in light of this. And so what should happen is that confessional worship starts with who God is, and then I reflect on who I am. And then I reflect on God's mercy and love, knowing that he has to be merciful, loving, and compassionate to want anything to do with me, and then rejoicing and celebrating that relationship that I have with him. Look, the worship that we used to do in the old normal, where we would just show up once a week, un, unintentional, un, unfocused, uh, distracted, unconsidered worship, where we just kind of have our coffee cup and we're like, all right, just let me know when the service is done and I'll go on to lunch. That's not going to cut it anymore. And I don't mean that's going to cut, not cut it anymore because God accepted it before and he's not going to accept it now. God didn't accept it before either. But whatever illusion of strength you thought it gave you, it's not going to do that for you anymore. This is a new day. Confessional worship has to be motivated from the heart. And I think that's why many of us are, are struggling with maybe the online worship, struggling to stay committed to this format because our worship maybe isn't as confessional, isn't as real, isn't as genuine as, we, as it should be. And again, if you're wondering, I'm talking to myself as well here. I am not as genuine as a worshiper as I desire to be. So grow with me in this. That's a part of confessional. It's, it's admitting that we're not where we want to be, not where God desires us to be. Now, I could leave you here uh, in, in what is a little bit of a downbeat, but I don't think it is. And, and I want to take you to one more place in the last vision that Daniel has. And it's very, very long. We're not going to read all of it. I only really want to focus on one verse because I want you to remember that you need to be courageous. This is the last vision I have for us today, for this new normal. We need to be a people of courage. Look at chapter 10, verse 19. Daniel's in the middle of a, of a, of a vision, and it's, it's, like I said, it's lengthy, and it's intense. And in chapter 19, or sorry, verse 19, an angel actually speaks to him and says, O man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. I hope that what this angel has said to Daniel is something that you'll hear from the word of God for you today. You are greatly loved. You are dearly loved. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you've been adopted as a child of God, and God loves you richly. You're adopted into his family. If you ever doubt that, think about the cross. God died so that you could live. The Son of God died so that you could live. You should not doubt God's love for you. And he didn't die on the cross so that you could spend your life doubting that love. Let that be a source of courage for you today. That God loves me. Walk with courage. Walk with strength. No matter what happens to me, I know that God loves me. And you can look back on Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and how God was there in the fire with them. God is there in the fire with you today too. In this new normal, he's with you in the midst of it. So know that you're dearly loved. And then he tells them, don't be afraid. Be at peace. Just like Daniel, we're getting glimpses of our future and it it's, seems bleak sometimes. It seems discouraging. There's disease, there's dissension, political turmoil, social unrest, economic uncertainty. Peace seems like the last thing available to us as an option. But don't be afraid. Peace is for us because God has secured peace with him through Jesus Christ. And all of this rests in his sovereign hand. God is in control of all the events taking place. I know it seems out of control, but he's not out of his control. Follow your monsters. Follow your anxieties. Follow your fears and give him those things. Give him what you're afraid of. And then be strong and courageous. This is not a sprint. The Christian life never has been a sprint. It's always been a marathon. But this season that we're in right now is a, is a particularly uphill portion of that marathon. Be faithful. Stick to the race. Don't give up. Think about what you were, the, the attitude and the, the, the positivity, the perspective that you had, the faithfulness you had to the Lord when all this started. And say, Lord, restore that in me. Give me energy. Give me strength. Give me courage to continue to pursue you despite the fact that I am wearing down and wearing thin. Be of good courage. Contribute where you are. Contribute to the flourishing where you are. Make your confession. Confess your weakness. Confess your fears. But also confess how great God is. Today we talked about four visions for our new normal. We talked about giving God control. Making a contribution to where we are confessing who God is and who we are in light of that, 
and then taking courage that God loves us, that we're not to be afraid, and that he wants to give us his courage. So my prayer for you today is that you have peace as you go out and that this new normal won't quite seem as daunting as maybe it was when we started today. Because God is on your side. He's fighting with you. He's in the fire with you. And he loves you dearly. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, would you please, for those who are listening, for those who are watching, for those uh, who are, are part of this service, may you restore to us the joy of our salvation. May you cut short our frustration. Fill us with hope. Let us turn over control to you. May we confess how great you are. May we have uh, the ability to stay faithful where we're at, contribute to the things that you've given us to contribute to. May we not slack off and give us great courage, Lord, because we're, we're afraid. We trust you, Lord, and we love you. In your son's name, amen.